Okay, now it's time to move to chapter six. And uh, chapter six is focus on wave mechanics in one dimension. Wave mechanics is a topic that you've already studied in uh, lower level uh, quantum physics courses where the idea was to solve Schrodinger equation. Uh, so far, we have not spoken much about wave function. In fact, we have not spoken about wave function at all. And uh, this chapter is an opportunity to give you the connection between the approach we've used, uh, which was based on bras and cats, which are those vectors that live in the quantum space, and the wave functions, so those functions of a position x, y, and z. Here we will focus on one dimension, and in particular, we are going to be interested in seeing uh, how we connect the quantum mechanics to uh, the cat and brass. And you will see that, in fact, a wave function is nothing else than a specific representation of the, uh, the cat's uh, vector. So that's, that's something that will come naturally, and we will uh, see how we can connect all this um, to the solution of Schrodinger equation. And that will allow us to move to the future chapters and start to uh, solve for a little bit more complicated problem, in particular in three dimension um, and other uh, uh, harmonic oscillator, for example. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the position eigenstate and the wave function. So as you know, in this course, we have mostly worked uh, starting with bras and cats, and we have been able to manipulate them by using operators. So let's do this here. Let's create, let's introduce the operator X, which is uh, there on the first line. So the operator X, and it, let me remind you that we put a hat on the operator so that there is no uh, ambiguity about what is a number, what is a cat, and what is an operator. And uh, this is a definition. The definition is that the operator X is such that when you apply it to an eigenstate, which is the cat x, we obtain the position of that cat. Okay, this is how we read this equation. So clearly, that operator is Hermitian. Why? Because all the eigenvalues of the operator are real. So that's one thing that's very important. So one thing that's a little bit different from what we've done so far is that the, the spectrum so the, in other words, the, the eigenvalues of the operator x actually take continuous values between minus infinity and plus infinity. So the, the main question we can ask ourselves is, can we use the eigenstates of the operator x as a basis? So, so far we didn't have a problem with that because we had uh, a discrete number of cats which were eigenstate of the operators, and we can just simply use an, uh, a projection with a sum and a, a Kronecker delta for the orthogonality relationship. We can no longer do it here. And there is a way, so this is the way we did it before, uh, just written on the left-hand side. So we wrote the identity operator for completeness uh, using a sum. There was no ambiguity there. And uh, each bracket was a probability amplitude. Now, the problem is, uh, and of course, we can, you could use uh, this again uh, for the orthogonality with the Kronecker delta. Uh, and for this. Now the problem is that if we have a continuous basis, uh, we can no longer do this. So let me try to explain that to you. Suppose that we have uh, A, which is just a position, a position uh, that, that describes the position of, the, of, of, a, of, of an eigenstate. Um, clearly, if the bracket A psi is non-zero for a certain value of A, we know that they, you can't find a delta x that's small enough so that a, the, 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 the projection of the states on a plus delta x is also non-zero, right? So that means that, um, that no matter what we do, there will always be an infinite number of points between a and a plus delta x. So in other words, there will be an, infinitely, an infinite number of brackets that are non-zero for between a position eigenstate and psi. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that when we, if we try to write something like this equation here, we're automatically going to have an infinity. Indeed, if we sum an infinite number of, of values that are non-zero, clearly, at the end of the day, we get an infinity. And obviously, it's impossible to normalize that cat vector psi. In other words, the basis is, using the basis that way is not right. Because if we use a basis and we cannot normalize the vector, then clearly something is wrong. 
But you probably have seen this in other courses that when we want to move from sums into integrals, we have to, uh, uh, from the sums uh, involving um, continuous basis, we have to move to integrals rather than sums. So the way we do this is by this equation here. So you see we have replaced a sum by an integral um, and that's going to solve everything for us. So we, we are going to be able to write now completeness relation. Uh, I'd like to remind you that the one on the right hand side of that equation is actually an operator. So st strictly speaking, we should put a little hat on the one uh, because it's an operator. You see the, the uh, other product between x and x. And on the other hand, uh, if we try to apply the identity operator to one of the bases, so one of the eigenstates of the operator x, we see that the only way for the last equation to be true, we need to have the bracket xx prime equal to the Dirac delta, delta x minus x prime. So you see the difference now is that even though before we had a Kronecker delta, now we have to work with a Dirac delta. And instead of using a sum, we have to use an integral. So if we do that now, of course, we can apply all those equations to understand what we are doing with the different cats. And uh, here it's a little bit of a busy slide, but the point is I introduced the identity operator twice. So the identity operator, just to show you, this is this uh, red box that we have here. And I'm going to apply it with x and with x prime in this equation here on the first line. So of course, now we can use the power of the direct, of the, of the uh, direct notation um, yes, yeah, so we have a, de a Dirac delta and we have Dirac notation in the same equation. So don't, don't, be, uh, don't get confused too much. So we have a, a, a Dirac notation, so we can, we can use the, the power of all this, which is, the, for example, that the, 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 um, the bracket xx prime is the delta Dirac, delta x minus x prime, which allows me to simplify the integral, to drop, because in the integral, everything will be uh, zero unless x equal to x prime. So that allows me to collapse one of the integral. We remember that the bracket psi x is a complex conjugate of the bracket x psi. So we end up with a square modulus. So we see that if we try to normalize the ket psi, this is the same as integrating over the entire space, in this case, one dimensional, of the projection of psi on the specific eigenstate x. This is how you read the equation, the last line of this equation. So in other words, when we look at this, we understand now uh, the interpretation of that equation. And the interpretation is that the probability of finding the particle between x and x plus dx will be given by dx times the square of the modulus of x psi. Why? because what we really have is that the square of the modulus is now a probability density. So a density, it's a linear density, and in order to have the probability, we have to multiply by a, a length scale, if you wish. Okay, so this is the way, the way we understand the probabilities, and probably start to, to be reminiscent of what you've learned for in quantum physics, um, where we have the wave functions. We have not spoken about wave functions, but we are almost there, okay? So you see that the bracket x psi is a very important one that shows up all the time. And we, have, we can decide to call it psi of x. This is a function of x. It's a number, right? It depends on x, so we can get psi of x. And this is what we call and so what you have encountered as the wave function. That in other words, we can replace the x psi by the wave function and psi x by the uh, complex conjugate of the wave function and then you get back to where you were before. I'd like to also note that the one in this equation on the left-hand side is a number. It's not an operator, and I hope by now you understand this very well. Okay, so we can use all this formalism to calculate expectation values, for instance. So the expectation values of value of the position for a given state psi is obtained by the usual equation that we have here on this slide. And this is actually fairly easy to calculate it if we remember to introduce the identity operator in the basis x. And when we do that, we end up with fairly simple equations. And the last line just simply tells you that the expectation value of x is the integral of x times the probability density of finding the state in x, which of course makes sense. We are using the square modulus of psi x as a weighting factor to the integral. And all that makes sense, obviously.
Now, we can also calculate amplitude uh, phi psi if we know the wave function phi of x and psi of x. And how do we do that? Well, <laughs> the answer is always the same. We introduce the identity operator. So in the last line there you have on the slide, all I've done is introduce the identity operator within the bracket phi psi. And of course, that allows me to highlight the wave function phi x and the complex conjugate of psi x. So you see, we can get back where, to where we were in quantum physics by introducing the identity operator in, for the completeness of this given basis, which in this case is a continuous basis of the position. Now that we have uh, all this, uh, th this framework where we can actually get access to the position uh, and we have defined the position operator through a definition of the Eveitzagan value problem, we can try to think about how we can translate uh, those states inside uh, the quantum space. So this is something we always try to do, is to say how we can, man how can we manipulate those states. It makes sense to try to translate um, an operator, um, a state like x in one dimension. This is essentially the only operation we can do with it. Uh, it's one of the only operations that we can do with it. Okay, so let's introduce a new operator that I call T. Again, you notice the little hat on the T. It's a proper operator and it's a definition there. So on the top of this slide, it's a definition that says that T of A applied to a ket X pro gives me X plus A instead. So I'm translating the ket by plus A. It's a definition. Now, suppose you take a general state Psi what is the effect of the translation T of A? Well, by now you probably know what to do. You are going to introduce the identity operator in the X basis so that we can uh, highlight uh, the, we, I mean, we can transfer, if you will, if, if you will, the, um, the effect of the translation T on the basis vector X. This is what we do right here. And of course, of course, here we use the uh, identity operator in the x prime for x prime, and that's the same x of x prime, of course, since we integrate over the, the variable x prime. And we can directly apply t of a on x prime and obtain that equation right there. Now, on the other hand, psi prime x, so the wave function, is the bracket x, uh, x psi prime, which is itself the bracket x of t of psi. In other words, what I need to do now is to project the equation that I just calculated on the top of this slide, so the second line, on the basis vector x. So when I do that, of course, so what I did there on the second, equa second equality sign for the wave function psi prime of x, I simply use the result from before, and I end up with the bracket x, x prime plus a. But we know that if we use two basis vectors of, in the x representation, this bracket will be a delta Dirac function for the difference between the two arguments. So as just as written there. And of course, when I do that, the integration just select that position of x prime, which is equal to x minus a. So in other words, when I apply the translation t of a to a state, to a vector, to a state vector, uh, an arbitrary state vector psi, this is equivalent to moving the argument to x minus a. That's what we found there. So this is, some students sometimes can be confused by the fact that when we apply t of a to a state vector x, we get x plus a, but when we do it, uh, when we do it on a, on a, on a state, on a basis, uh, on, on a general state psi, we had, uh, get x minus a, but it makes sense because if you if you look at the wave function psi versus the wave function psi prime of x minus a, by the fact that we are shifting the argument by minus a is actually can actually correspond to moving the the wave function to the right by a value of a. So I, I, this is a good place for you to stop the screencast and and convince yourself of, of this uh, of this fact. Okay. Now, we have a translation operator, and here we go again. We are going to try to see if we can understand something about the physics uh, from there. So remember, if, we tr if I translate a wave function, 
I do not expect that the overall in, um, the normalization um, condition and the overall probability will change. And indeed, I can calculate the bracket psi, psi, psi prime psi prime by just introducing what psi prime is from the previous uh, slide, right? The, this, from this equation. So I can introduce what psi prime is in this equation. And of course, I know, I know that uh, this bracket has to be equal to psi psi because there is no reason why I would change the overall probability by translating my, by just shifting rigidly the wave function. In other words, what it's telling me is that the T operator, the translation operator has to be unitary. This is yet another unitary operator. And by now, I hope that you have the reflex to know that if you have a unitary transformation, you can introduce the generator of that operator. And the generator is going to be Hermitian. And a Hermitian operator is an operator you like very much because it usually corresponds to a physical property that you can measure. And this is what we are going to do for the rest of the screencast, in fact. So, um, of course, here I just showed you how we can also see the effect of the translation on the bra x and on the on the on the, on the, on the bra x operating on the left or on the right. Uh, the reason why I write this here is because since the translation, uh, the dagger, so the, the effect of on the bra is the same as the inverse effect on the ket, right? That's what it means to be unitary. Unitary means that t dagger is equal to t minus one of a. In other words, it's t of minus a, right? Translate the inverse of translation by a is translation by minus a, and this is what we write there. And by doing that, we can prove again that property that I showed you on the previous slide that the x representation of a translation by a of a ket psi is actually psi x minus a. This is essentially the same proof as we did in the previous slide, but a little bit easier based on the fact that t is unitary. Okay, so it's time now to move to the generator of translations. Um, that makes sense, as I said just a second ago, that we have a unitary transformation and we can always write something like this. By now you, uh, you shouldn't be surprised by it. Um, and we can, all, I, I, as I always argue, there's no arguing this because I didn't tell you what px was. So in fact, we can then always choose a px for which this will be true. But it turns out that the px that works is, a P, is, a, is something that is, this is going to be uh, an operator that has a very strong um, uh, physical meaning. And this is what we are going to study in this section. And in fact, this is what we are going to carry over the entire chapter for the rest of this chapter, and we will see extremely important uh, consequences on the physical properties of, of space, really. Okay, so the infinitesimally, infinitesimal translation operator, so a small distance dx, is going to be defined by this, and we know by now, we have proven that for the Hamiltonian, we've proven that for the rotation of the spin, that the generators, generator has to be Hermitian, and you can, you can check that if you wish, uh, you just have to impose that T is a uh, unitary transformation. Okay, we can also move beyond that and find the translation of a uh, finite distance, not infinitesimally small. And of course, we end up again with this complex exponential, uh, just using the usual trick of the Taylor series of the complex exponential and the uh, the application of the infinitesimally small operation, um, infinitesimally small translation operator many, many times over. This is something we've done for time, this is something we've done for angle rotation. So this is essentially something you are very familiar with by now. I like again to remind you that this complex exponential, the, an operator that shows in the argument of complex exponential is not something that's easy to calculate unless we operate it on an eigenstate of px. And we have seen that before, and if you cannot do that, then you will need to use the Taylor series of the exponential. But believe me, we are going to try to avoid to do that. Instead, we are going to work in the basis of the operator, the, in the basis of the eigenstate of px. And I think by now you must have this reflex to understand that because px is Hermitian, right? Every generator of an operator is Hermitian, of a unitary operator is Hermitian, we can use the, the, the basis of the eigenstate of px 
as a good basis. Okay, and this is what we are going to do because then we can, then we can use that operator very easily. In fact, we will see that the generator is the linear momentum operator, but I've not proven any of that just yet, so we are going to do it. Well, intuitively, you might think, well, we are trying to talk about uh, translation in space. You know that the linear momentum is also about translation in space, so there is some intuitive connection between the two, but we are going to have more than intuition in just a few minutes. Okay, so the operator is our mission, we know that. And uh, what we're going to do now is calculate some commutation relations. Again, you should get used to it. This is always essentially the same thing. The physics, in, of, the quantum physics, is quantum mechanics is always in the commutation. So let's calculate this. It's going to be a little bit tedious, uh, nothing really hard, but uh, I just have to lots of bookkeeping. So let's try to calculate the commutator between the, op the position operator and the translation operator. Clearly, you already know that that commutator is not going to be equal to zero, right? Because just think about applying this commutator to a basis vector of x. Clearly, if you try to do that, you in, on the first term will translate and then get the position. The other one will get the position then translate. So clearly, the numerical value in front of this will be different since we will calculate the position at two different places. So we know that this commutator is not going to be equal to zero. If we find it to be equal to zero, we clearly made a mistake. Let's try to see that. So the first thing, of course, is that since we have a translation of inf infinitesimally small uh, distance, we can just plug it in here. Nothing really fancy, it's just substitution. And then we find that, uh, of course, the value, that the, the part that, in, that involved the identity operator drops easily. And then we end up with this commutator being proportional to the commutator between x and px. This is what we find. There is absolutely no reason why x and px should commute. We actually know nothing about them. So, so far, I think we have just to write it like this, and we'll see what happens. So we are making progress. Now, we are going to also apply this in the, to a general uh, state Psi. And since we are involving translation operators and position operators, it makes sense to introduce the identity operator expressed in the X basis, because we know how T and X operators operate on those, ba on those basis vectors. So we, that's what we do. That's what's written right there, which we just apply, you know, we just apply. We know that, that uh, the translation by delta x just translate the basis vector by plus delta x, and so on and so forth. We do this. And uh, of course, when we do these equations, uh, we end up with something that's very simple at the end. I mean, this is very elementary, so I also suggest that you pause your screencast and make sure that you can follow those lines. Uh, they are all very elementary. The point is that when you're all set and done, the effect of this operator, this commutator, is simply to multiply the vector psi by delta x. Okay? But at the same time, at the same time, we have the, the equation on the top of this slide, which says it's equal to minus, so operating on the state psi is also minus i delta x over h bar times the commutator between x and px. So in other words, if you put those two result to, results together, you find that x p x is to be equal to i h bar. So again, I strongly suggest that if you didn't see this coming, go back to the previous slide, so rewind your screencast, and you will see that it comes automatically. This is an extremely important result that says that the commutator between state x, between, between operator x and p x is equal to i h bar. Why is it important? Well, remember, we have two Hermitian operator x and p x, and if the commutator is given by i h bar, then we automatically know something about the uncertainty relationship. This is a general formula, general theorem that we found. In fact, what we find here is that the uncertainty on x times the uncertainty on p x should always be larger or equal to h bar over two. This is an uncertainty principle that you have seen many times over, and has tremendous impact on what we can measure. So before we move on. Let's try to think a little bit about the time evolution of a particle of mass m that moves in one dimension. 
So the Hamiltonian is, of course, the, the generator of time translation. This is the operator that comes into the complex exponential uh, of, for, for, the, for the time translation operator. So um, now I've made a big leap, of course. I've decided, I, I, I didn't tell you this, but I actually pretty much said that Px was the linear momentum. And this is cheating, clearly, because I didn't prove that. Okay. So what we are going to do now is that we are going to suppose this is true, that Px, so the generator of translation, is indeed the linear momentum. And then now that we have used this, I'm going to show you that indeed this is the operator that works, that will give the, pro the proper uh, physical result if we decide that Px is indeed the linear momentum. This is what we are going to do now. Okay. So we have that Hamiltonian, which is as general as it gets in one dimension. It's kinetic energy plus some potential that we do not tell, we don't say what it is. It's a general potential. And the first thing we want to do is to calculate the time evolution of the expectation value of the position. This is uh, so we can, of course, remember our formula for this. We obtain this uh, formula. We can, we of course don't have the additional term uh, that would come if the Hamiltonian was, I, I mean, if the if, the, um, if there was a, uh, a time dependence, an explicit time dependence involved, we don't have that. Uh, this is no, there's no involved, um, there's no explicit time dependence. So we end up with this equation. Of course, we know that the potential part, uh, since it only depends on x, will commute with x. And we end up with this equation. And of course, we know how to calculate that kind of commutator especially that we know the commutator between x and px. We just found it was ih bar. And so we find this, and then we replace px x by minus ih bar. Remember, the, the, uh, if xpx, the commutator xps is ih bar, the commutator px x is minus ih bar. And of course, we find at the end that the time um, derivative of the expectation value of the position seems to be the expectation value of px over m. And of course, we recognize here uh, nothing else than something that looks like that velocity is the derivative of the position. So that gives us a pretty good hint that Px is indeed the linear momentum. Okay, But we can do even better than this. We can do the same exercise by calculating the time derivative of the expectation value of Px. And again, we use the same formula. We don't have explicit dependence of time. And when we do this, and this is something we've done in class, but I strongly invite you to try to find this, the second equality, we end up with that the time derivative of the, of the expectation value of Px is equal to the expectation value of minus dv over dx. And of course, now you remember that in three dimension, a force is minus the gradient of the potential. So in one dimension, it's simply the derivative. So what we have here is a classical law. This is the second Newton's law that say f equal ma. So the only way to have a time dependence in the expectation value of the linear momentum is to have an external force, which is, of course, given by minus the derivative with respect to space of the potential. So this is very important that really establishes that Px is indeed the linear momentum. So this is the, an important result. The important result is that the generator of translation in space is the linear momentum. And this, these things can be summarized um, in what is called the Ehrenfest theorem. The Ehrenfest theorems are those two equations that looks very much classical, but I don't want you to be fooled by that. Quantum mechanically, the dynamics is certainly not classical, and this is what's written there. It's not essentially classical. What is classical is maybe the expectation value. Indeed, think about this. For, an end, for a moment. If we have a force at the position x, it can be tailor, it can be it can be developed in a Taylor series around around that the, the expectation value. Okay? It can certainly be done. And then in that case we find that the the first derivative with time of the expectation value of Px, which as we have established will be the expectation value of the force, there is a certain number of, uh, I mean, at first order, this is a classical effect. 
But if we look at further orders, we see that this is not a classical effect. So classically, we would not have the delta x squared and so on and so forth. So we have to, don't, don't be fooled by saying, don't, do not say that Ehrenfest's theorem uh, establishes that the motion is classical. It is not true. The, the fact that we have to use expectation values shows that indeed, if you look at the, at the motion, the dynamics itself, the dynamics is not classical. Only the expectation value makes you think that it looks like it's classical. That's an extremely important result. In fact, a Renfest theorem is used uh, a lot in, uh, to, to describe the dynamics of quantum uh, systems, quantum, in quantum materials in particular, but in quantum system in general. So I'd like to, before, I know the screencast is not over. In fact, there's still quite a f bit of work. And, but I'd like to touch base because there was a lot of new results shown in this part. And uh, I'd like to touch base on a couple of things uh, and to s remind you what we've done. The first thing we've done is introduce a position operator X. And we've introduced it by defining an eigenvalue problem. And we said that, that X value are all real, so X is an Hermitian operator. And then we, because of that, we can use X, the basis of the eigenstate of X, uh, we can use it uh, to represent any ket. And this is due to completeness and orthogonality. We spent a couple of slides explaining that we can no longer use the summation or the Kronecker delta because we have a com we have a dis we have a, our basis is continuous, is not discrete. Okay, and then that left us that that, that led us to other, to have an interpretation of what d what d x times the square modulus of the bracket x psi was, uh, and we talk about probability of finding a particle between x and x plus dx because we have to introduce probability density. And this is due to the fact that the argument we are using, are, I mean, the, 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 the physical argument, the physical variable is a continuous variable. And then we find very simply that the connection with quantum, the wave function and quantum physics approach that you've used probably in earlier courses is simply that it's a notation thing. The, bra the, the bracket x psi is the wave function of psi x. This is purely notation. This is a notation. This is, n this is just an e an another way to represent it. In fact, some authors do not use brackets at all. They just use functions. I think that we've seen the power of using uh, the direct notation, and we keep going to keep using them. So summary number two, after we did that, we introduced the translation operator which simply act, we act on some eigenstate of the X operator, we find that operator was unitary and that allowed us to introduce a generator of translation. The generator is Hermitian. And as, her, as a Hermitian operator, we know that it must have a physical meaning, just like we found a physical meaning for the spin operator and for the Hamiltonian in previous chapters. And we found, in fact, through Herenfest theorems that the physical interpretation of Px is that it is the linear momentum. And then finally, a very important result we established is that there is a commutator relationship between the position and the linear momentum, and that relation is IH bar, which has very important uh, effect on uncertainty relationship between knowing the position and the linear momentum of a particle. In fact, it's larger or equal to h bar over 2. And we are going to talk about that more in the next sections of this screencast. OK, now that we have a momentum operator and we also know the position basis, a natural question is to know what's the, how can we um, express the momentum operator in the position basis. So for an arbitrary state, we can look at uh, the translation of a state psi for an infinitesimally small distance delta x. Again, same trick, we introduce intro the, the identity operator. We know what's the effect of the translation operator on the state. And in the last uh, equation there, which simply replace uh, x by x, pr uh, x plus delta x by x prime, and since we integrate by between minus infinity and plus infinity, it doesn't change, it, change much anything. So we, we end up with that equation. At the same time, we also know that uh, if we use Taylor expansion at the, for psi at x prime minus dx, this is the same as the f function as x prime with correction. So at first order, the correction would be minus delta x times the derivative. 
And of course, we recognize the representation of the wave function and the representation of the derivative. So we have all that. We are going to, to substitute what we just calculated uh, with the blue uh, rectangle, and we end up with this equation right here. Now we also, of course, uh, we also find that uh, we can just take out the identity operator on the first uh, part of the on the right hand side, and we obtain uh, the other equation on the left hand side, on the right hand side. But at the same time, we know that the translation of infinitesimally small distance is obtained uh, say obtained by by uh, the uh, using an by an equation with the generator of translation. So that gives us very quickly uh, a good description of what the effect of Px on a state is. So it looks a little bit complicated. Uh, the representation there looks uh, slightly complicated. Uh, we can clearly see there is something about the derivative, but uh, it's still a little bit complicated. I, I think that we can do better uh, in terms of uh, what we can do. And in fact, if we start from the equation from the red box and, and we keep working on it, uh, the way to work on it is to uh, project the equation on the bra x on both sides, and that allows us to highlight the presence of a direct delta, delta x minus x prime, and thanks to that we, we, we are moving forward and we see that the x representation of px applied on the general ket psi is the same thing as h bar over i times the derivative of that wave function. So in other words, uh, we can write something like this, uh, that in particular for a state um, x prime, we can write the equation in the red box, which is nothing else than the x representation of px. So you can look at the x px x prime as a matrix element of the operator px in the basis x. And you see that that matrix element essentially is diagonal. I mean, it's really be hard to say this because the matrix here, it's not really a matrix since we have an infinite number of rows and infinite number of lines. Um, but it looks very much like we have an um, we have a diagonal term, which is the derivative of uh, the state. So this is a very important result. In fact, it says that p x in the x basis is h bar over i times the derivative in space. So that's very useful because when we are going to use the wave function in the real space uh, representation, we can replace the linear momentum by the derivative with respect to the distance times h bar over i. So that allows us to now work in the momentum space. So the momentum space, uh, we'll remember that Px is a Hermitian operator. Therefore, it has an, eigen, uh, an eigen's value problem uh, of, uh, with eigen state P and eigen value P. And of course, it's another uh, continuous variable, so same as x. Uh, we can use uh, the P basis uh, because it's complete in the sense of the integral that's in, with the blue box. And it's also orthogonal uh, in the sense that uh, the bracket p prime p is a direct delta, delta p prime minus p. And we can play the same game that we did for the x basis, finding that the normalization of a condition on the general ket vector is simply saying that the integral of dp times the square modulus of the bracket p psi is equal to 1. And the interesting thing is that p psi is actually a wave function, but instead of being psi x as we usually do uh, for a wave function, this is a representation in p. So there is not less information in that representation than in the x representation, it's just done for convenience. So. Um, if you remember what we just did in the, the previous paragraph, we find that the representation of px, now we can, we can certainly uh, calculate this matrix element xp, xp. And in, in this case, we find that uh, px, of course, operating on p is the same as pp. The first p I said is a number, so we can take it out of the bracket. 
So this is equal to xp, but on the at, at the same time, um, we know that the x representation of px, you're right, in the x basis, uh, px is equivalent to the derivative. That's what we calculated, right? So in other words, um, we find that we have a certain function of x, which I call the, the, the bracket xp. It's a function of x. It's a function that's such that when I take a derivative times a constant, I get the same function. So in other words, that function has to be an exponential. And the exponential, in fact, is eipx over h bar. So that means that the x representation of a state p is n times eipx over h bar. The n is there because I cannot tell what it is with that uh, differential equation. I'm going to in have to impose the normalization of the state to find the, the normalization uh, number n. In fact, we're going to do it right here. Um, the idea is to simply calculate the bracket p prime p. And we know the, what it is. It's the Dirac delta p minus p prime. And we do this calculation by using the extra representation of the state p. We find uh, that because of the integral of the complex exponential is always 0 unless p equal to p prime. So the, in other words, this is equal to delta p minus p prime times 2 pi h bar. And this comes from, if you're not convinced, you can use uh, tables, uh, but uh, you can convince yourself by drawing the, the unit circle in complex plane. And that allows you to find that n is 1 over square root 2 pi over 2 pi times h bar. So in other words, the final result is that the x representation of the momentum state p is 1 over square root 2 pi h bar times a complex exponential. Okay, so that's very interesting because what we find is that that particular state is oscillating with wavelengths lambda that's given by h over p. So this is a relationship between the linear momentum of a particle and a wavelength. In other words, it's a connection between, the, the, between a wave-like property and a particular particle property. This, is, this comes from the De Broglie. The Broglie relationship came from lambda equal h over p. And we have this duality again because we are talking about um, the fact that we have sharp peaks for the p, rep for the p prime representation of p. Right? It's this, uh, actually the orthogonality relation. And we also have this wave-like representation for the x representation of p. That means, even though we are representing the same reality, the state that we are looking at is, is the ket p. In one representation is a sharp peak, in the other representation is a completely delocalized uh, wave. Uh, both representations are exactly fine, but uh, this is a different point of view that we use. And in fact, they are very much related to what we call Fourier transforms. Uh, again, how do we see that? Well, we see that by introducing the identity operator in the x basis uh, between the, the, the bra p and the ket psi. And because we know the representation, what, what the px bracket re represents, it's, it's the complex exponential we just calculated. And of course, we know the complex conjugate as well. What we, what we note there is that in order to go from the p representation to the x representation and vice versa, the only thing we are doing is a Fourier transform, right? This is, this, these are Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform, as you know, it's a linear transformation that does not add or remove any information. It's just another way to represent the same information. Um, and this is, uh, this is exactly the relationship that we have with the p representation and x representation. As you know, Using a representation does not add information. It just makes it easier to obtain, uh, depending on the operator we are interested in. So to summarize this second part that we have, um, we have introduced the, uh, the eigenvalue problem uh, Pxp equal Pp. And we can do that because we know Px has to be Hermitian, since it's a propagator. And then we find that in x representation of the of the state is given by uh, this complex exponential, and the x representation of operator is nothing else than h bar over r i divided by multiplied by the derivative respect to x. And of course, because they represent a basis, 
we can use the orthogonality uh, relationship and the completeness relationship as well. So we've made a lot of progress. We have an uh, extra representation. We have introduced the generator of translations. And uh, we have uh, realized that we can represent any state in the X basis or the P basis. And we even found the rules to go from one to the other. And they are uh, very closely related to Fourier transform. Now, we can try to move a little bit and get into, try to see uh, what would be a realistic wave function that we could use for any, uh, any uh, uh, representation of physical phenomena. And this is where we are going to introduce the Gaussian wave packet. So first of all, why can't we use a basis function to work as, as a legitimate wave function that we can start with? So why can't we use the P state on the X state, right? The X representation of a P state is obtained by uh, the complex exponential, we know that. So we could be tempted to use a single momentum state for all calculations. The problem with that one is that it's not physically allowed. Indeed, for that state, the expectation, the, the uncertainty on P is equal to zero, right? Clearly, the uncertainty is zero since it's a single P state. So from that perspective, uh, the probability of finding a particle between x plus and x plus dx at the same time is obtained by that equation, right? This is always the x representation and square dx. And we know by looking at the, since we know that xp is a complex exponential, the, its uh, square modulus is equal to 1. I mean, in fact, in this case, it's 1 over 2 pi h bar because of the normalization function. In other words, the probability of finding a particle between x plus dx is a constant. It's dx over 2 pi h bar. In other words, if I try to uh, normalize that function, I get an infinite. I cannot normalize. So in other words, delta x, there is absolutely a full uncertainty on finding the position, which translates as well in the fact that we cannot normalize. And the only way, the, the reason why we have delta x is equal to infinity is because we have to obey uncertainty relationship, delta p, delta x, being larger or equal to h bar over 2. Since delta p is zero by construction, the only way to, to survive the uncertainty relationship is delta x to be infinity. So we have a state that cannot be normalized, so it's certainly not a physically allowed state. So for that reason, uh, in order to be able to normalize this, the, the function, we need to use the superposition of state. And um, that superposition, uh, by definition, is called a wave packet. So it's a packet of waves. It's a number, a certain number of p state, or a certain number of x state, of course, so we can always uh, use either representation. So in fact, in x representation, so the wave function psi x, it will be chosen to be a Gaussian. So this is a choice that we make. And uh, we are going to see why we make that choice in a few minutes. Uh, there are a few reasons, but it's, it can be seen as fairly arbitrary. It's just that it's also convenient, and we'll see why in a minute. And it has to be properly normalized. That's the reason why there is a number n in front that we will um, calculate in just a, just a few seconds. Uh, in fact, we calculate it right here on this line. And uh, we obtain n being 1 over square root of square root pi a. The way we get all this information, and that's what I write on the screencast, is by looking at the appendix of uh, the Townsend book. Uh, that uh, gives all the relationship to do integrals with uh, Gaussians. Um, the advantage of Gaussians is that we can do most um, integration uh, analytically, so which is, which is nice. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we use Gaussian. Now, the probability density is going to be obtained by psi star psi x. Since the Gaussian is a real wave function, uh, the psi star psi x is simply the square of the Gaussian, which is still a Gaussian, of course. Uh, with is just uh, oscillating a little bit. I mean, it's just decaying just a little bit faster since uh, we, we multiply the argument by 2. In fact, the argument A, which is in the denominator of the, uh, of the exponential, is, can be seen as the, as, as the width of the Gaussian uh, distribution. And we can even go, if we took A being very small, we could even have a delta Dirac function. Uh, in fact, if a was going to zero, 
uh, in that case, we would see that the wave function is actually a single x state, uh, which we don't want to have because a single x state is delta x equals zero or delta p equals infinity, so we cannot integrate that one. This is the idea. Okay, but anyway, the case, the point is that we can calculate the probability density from, from that wave function, from that choice. And we can think, ask why, why Gaussian? Well, the reason is that it's mostly for mathematical convenience. Just like we saw for calculating the normalization, integrals can be easy to calculate. For example, it's easy to calculate the expectation value of x. Uh, in this case, we know it's zero because we have an even function times an odd function, so it's fine. Uh, we can also calculate x squared, and uh, I refer to the uh, tables of integrals that you can find from uh, in Townsend book or in any book, uh, usually Gaussians, uh, integral involving Gaussians are, are listed in an appendix. And you find that uh, the expectation value of x squared is a squared over 2. That allows you to calculate the uncertainty, delta x, which is always given by the formula of square root of uh, expectation value of x squared minus the, the square of the expectation value. And you will find that the uh, uncertainty is a over square root 2. So again, a is really confirmed that a is a measure of the width of the distribution. So this is what I showed with the, the red arrows right there. So the this is the uncertainty of finding the particle at some position. Now, we can move to the p representation of the same state and usual trick uh, we obtain that equation that looks complicated, but it's not complicated at all. It's just obtained by introducing the identity operator in the x basis. And then you will have an x, uh, a px uh, bracket, which you know is just the complex exponential. That's what we obtain. And again, we can calculate those integrals from tables. And we find that the p representation of my uh, state psi is also a Gaussian in the p representation. That's another reason why we like Gaussian so much, because they are both Gaussian. The, the representation is both Gaussian in the x representation and the p representation. You will notice now, though, that the a term, which was the, the width of the Gaussian distribution in the x representation, is now, sh now shows up in the numerator of the argument. So in other words, the smaller the a, the larger the distribution in the p state. Okay. Um, in fact, this is not surprising that we find a Gaussian. It's simply because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. And we can, of course, calculate the probability uh, density and the probability of finding the state between state p and state p plus dp. So here you have to compare the left and the right. When we have a uh, broad distribution in the x representation, we have a sharp distribution in the p representation and vice versa. So this is not that surprising again because of the, the uncertainty relationship that we know about. So kind of the product between the two should, should, be, should remain constant. In fact, we can calculate that. We can calculate the delta x and the delta p. Um, I believe we already uh, calculated delta x. It was a over square root 2. So let's try to calculate delta p. And for that, we need the expectation value of px, which again is zero because p because we have the integral of an even time odd function. And for p square x, uh, again, we use uh, formulas from tables and we find that uh, the expectation value of px square is h bar square over 2a square. That allows us to calculate the uncertainty uh, relationship again by this formula. And we find the uncertainty on px is h bar over square root 2a. Okay, remember the delta x was a over square root 2, and we find eventually that the delta x delta px is equal to its to h bar over 2. So this is the lower bound of the uncertainty relationship. So that tells us that in fact Gaussians are the minimum uncertainty state. That means that if you want to have the best balance between delta x and delta px uncertainty, the best choice is a Gaussian. So that's another reason why Gaussians are such a good choice for a wave packet. So there's two reasons then, the, there's actually three reasons. The first is it's easy to calculate the integrals using uh, uh, analytical methods, that's one. The second is that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So that means that the X and P representation of the Gaussian, of, of, the, of the state is a Gaussian, that's good. And finally, what we find is that if you have a Gaussian wave packet, 
this will be the lowest uncertainty state. This is the particular state for which delta px times delta x is minimal. That's what we have here. Because we have established that delta x delta px should be larger or equal to h bar over 2. And here we just have the equal sign. So uh, in, in the book, there is a good example for you to, to, to make sure that you can manipulate all those numbers and uh, understand the integral is by calculating the expectation value now in this case in the, in the position space. And uh, you do that on the second part uh, by simply uh, remembering that the x representation of px is h bar over i times the first derivative uh, with respect to x. And then everything falls from there. Now we can, we can go one step further uh, and look at the time evolution of a free particle. And we've done all the math for, to understand that about the time evolution of a free particle. Um, what we did in that time, at, at that time, we realized that if we have, if the particle um, evolves in a Hamiltonian that's not, um, that is not um, explicitly time dependent, the time evolution can be simply obtained by this uh, complex um, exponential that involves the Hamiltonian. Now, we know the Hamiltonian is simple because we, say we, we are talking about a free space, okay? This is what we want. This is time evolution, a free particle. Free particle means no potential. So the Hamiltonian is just given by the kinetic energy, Px squared over 2m. And um, as, I, as we know, this term there, the complex exponential uh, involving minus i h t over h bar, it's not easy to calculate unless it applies to an eigenstate of h. An eigenstate of h would be an eigenstate of px squared, which would be an eigenstate of px. So the, the best approach to calculate, this calcu to calculate this now is to insert the identity operator in the p basis, because in that case, I can directly apply the complex exponential to a p basis, and I end up with the last equation which is much simpler than the previous equation because I only have numbers, I no longer have operator px. So that's, that's all good and, and, and fine. Uh, we can then calculate the x representation of that state by operating, by, 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 um, by projecting the previous, the state that we had in the previous slide, so this one on the last, the, the very last line, on the x basis. So this is what we obtain. Uh, and we can do this calculation again because we can replace the x representation of p by what we know in the complex exponential. And then we end up again uh, with something that's pretty simple to do because we also know the p representation of the Gaussian wave packet. So we end up with three complex exponential. And then we this is again looking at, at uh, analytical formula for integrals, we can calculate this. So we end up, so, so, so what have we done here? We had a Gaussian wave packet to start with, and then we evolve it in time. And we find that we have actually, it's possible to do it analytically. In fact, the solution is right on your screen right there. So one thing that's, that's important to notice is that this looks very much like a Gaussian, right? So that means the time evolution of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Well, not quite so fast. There is a Gaussian, it looks like a Gaussian, but in fact there is a complex term now. So this is not really strict to Sansu a uh, Gaussian because it's no longer a real wave function. It has a complex, yeah, it has a, a, a complex part to it, which is fine. But that also means that um, what we learn about Gaussian is no longer true for a time evolution. So let's let me let's see what what it really means. But before we do that, let's see what what we have. We see that the that if we calculate the delta x, so the uh, uncertainty relation, uh, the uncertainty, so the, the the error that we for that particular state that I showed you, we can calculate it using the standard uh, formula that we've used before, and we find that the, the equation we have there. Uh, which sees that delta x actually goes up with time. So you start with a Gaussian, and as you, it evolves, the Gaussian wave packet is going to, uh, to broaden. Okay? And this is something we can do. It's going to look just like this. Okay? So we can do it like this. You start with a Gaussian, and the, the, the density, so the, the, psi, the square of the, of the psi, the square of the of the modulus 
moves like this with time and broaden. This is what this equation says. Okay. So this is quite surprising. This is not surprising, right? This is not surprising because some of the so, so that go that Gaussian wave packet is a, has different contributions for different p's. So some so the part so the different p's evolve at different velocity. Therefore, the faster one go faster and the slow one goes slower. Therefore, you have a broadening of the wave packet. That's not that surprising. So delta x goes up. Now the big question is: Does delta p goes down? And the obvious answer that people usually say, yes, it's going down because we have a Gaussian and delta x, delta p, x should be minimal for a Gaussian. Well, not so fast because remember, we no longer have a Gaussian really. It turns out that the charge density, so the square, the probability density that I call charge density on this plot is a Gaussian, but the wave function is not. It has a complex phase. And uh, which uh, complex phase, it depends on time. So we don't no longer have a Gaussian. In fact, the uncertainty on P should not change. Why? So, so I'm going to come back to this in a second, but the uncertainty on P does not change. Why not? Because we do not have external forces. So if there is no external forces, there is no way to change the momentum of my particle. So if I have an uncertainty of the momentum, the uncertainty is still the same. And it comes from the fact that, of course, the expectation value and so on and so forth should uh, have a time derivative of equal to zero since the Hamiltonian so in order to calculate the, uh, the uh, derivative of the expectation value, um, we need to calculate the expectation value of the commutator with the Hamiltonian. And since P cl Px clearly commute with the Hamiltonian, since the Hamiltonian is Px square over 2m, then we have no changes. So this is something that's very important. It turns out delta P does not decrease. Delta P is a constant. Okay even though delta x increases. So you can, this is totally compatible with the fact that the Gaussian is the minimum uh, uncertainty state because we do no longer have a Gaussian. The probability density is a Gaussian, but the wave function is not. So before we, before we go there, and I, I, I dropped these two slides, but I'm, I want to, to come back to them. Uh, we find that the, the, the uncertainty goes up with time, and this is a quantum mechanical effect. And so it's interesting to know is that when that delta x, let's say, is multiplied by square root 2, that, that should be observable. This is just to give a, an idea of the, of the length scales here. So when h bar square times t square m square over time a4, uh, a to the power 4 is equal to 1, let's say, that means that it gives me a time t at which there is enough, enough changes that this can be observable. So it's a quantum mechanical effect. So we can calculate that for a macroscopic object of a one gram, or gram of mass and for an electron. And when you do that, you find that because h bar is so large, it would take much more than the many, 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 many more times the age of the universe to see an effect on my microscopic object. On the other hand, for an electron, it would take less than a femtosecond to see the electron change its delta x just coming from the fact that you have a time evolution like this. So this is a very important result that quantum mechanics mostly manifests itself for small systems, which is not a big surprise, otherwise we would have more intuition of everyday life of quantum mechanics. So now let's see what's the effect of what we studied so far on the double slit experiment. So you know the double slit experiment uh, is that experiment that first showed that there was an interference effect uh, in for electrons. Uh, so even though there are particles, they seem to be behaving like uh, like waves. Uh, and what we are going to see is that uh, the delta x delta p x larger or equal to h bar over two, which is the uncertainty principle on x and p x, uh, they, they, it directly comes into the play into play for for the double slit experiment. And I believe we are ready to do that now because um, really in the double slit experiment, we do have a Gaussian uh, wave packet uh, incoming, let's say, from the left. And 
impinging of those two slits of the two the ballistic experiment. So this we we are ready to 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 understand it. So this is the experiment here in a very schematic way. Uh, on the left hand side, it's, uh, the the wave packet is going to come from the left hand side, and you have two slits. They are separated by a distance d. And if we look at the on, on a on a we can measure where the we can measure an interference pattern on a on on a screen tactic screen some distance away uh, as a function of the angle of incidence, and we find that the distance between the maximum in the interference pattern is given uh, by uh, d sine theta is equal to n lambda, where lambda is obtained by the uh, wavelength of the electrons using the De Broglie um, relationship, so uh, which is uh, which is uh, h bar over p, h over p, and d is the distance, and uh, sine theta is of course the angle that that we obtain. So this is not a big surprise. We know the interference between two waves. So if we accept that the electron behave like waves, we're not surprised that there is interference. But there is something that's a little bit uh, more complicated: is that if this experiment could be obtained by just shining a single electron at a time, a single particle at a time. And even if you do that and you repeat uh, the measurement, so you wait long enough between the, the, the impact, you reproduce the interference pattern. So what it means is that the interference is not just between two, it's not actually between multiple electrons, it's for a given electron. So that means that an electron actually has a finite probability to go through any of the two slits. Okay? It's very similar to the stern galactic experiment that we looked at before. Uh, so, th but uh, in this case, it's just instead of, of measuring the, mom the spin angular momentum, we are, we are really measuring the position. So the the x operator that we have uh, introduced in this uh, in this chapter. So let's see what we can learn more about this. Well, we can learn that uh, if we are able, suppose for a second that we we find a way to know exactly through which hole the particle goes. Suppose it is possible to do that. And we know that if we do that, automatically we reduce the, 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 the uncertainty in x, because if there is only one hole, the, the uncertainty is certainly going to be smaller than d over 2. So the uncertainty on the x position, so the vertical position, is going to go on uh, below uh, d over 2. At the same time, there will be an uncertainty on delta px that's going to be larger or equal to a, 2h over d. Right? So here we, we drop some uh, some pies just to have an upper bound, but that's, that doesn't change anything in the discussion. So the point is that we increase significantly the uncertainty over the delta uh, delta px, and of course what we we get from this is that there is a relationship on the uncertainty on the angle delta theta, which is of course obtained from between delta by the ratio between delta px and the value of p. And since delta px is larger than 2h over d and p is h over lambda, corresponding to the Broglie wavelength, we find that this, the uncertainty on angle of for the interference pattern is going to be equal to 2 lambda over d. And this is going to be so large, so 2, two lambda over d is, much, is pretty large. That means that we, the, the uncertainty is going to be larger, in fact, that... Um, is going to be larger than the distance between the interference pattern. In other words, we wipe out the interference pattern. In other words, we no longer have this effect that the electron, uh, the, the, the uncertainty about the electron. So in other words, it's true from this experiment that if we know which hole the electron went through, we actually moved, we actually changed the state of the electron. And in this case, we wipe out the interference pattern. So that highlights the fact that we, when we make a measurement and when we know something about a uh, state, we do modify the state itself. So this is, this is mostly confirming uh, other predictions we've made uh, in previous chapters in this course. So let's now move to the general properties of the solution of Schrodinger equation in position space. Uh, we have seen this equation before, Schrodinger equation, time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation, uh, that comes directly from from the, the beginning of the of the of the chapter on time evolution that we've done. So chapter four. Uh, this is written here in terms of brackets, and uh, we can we can write this uh, by remembering now that in the x representation, uh, 
the px operator is obtained by the derivative d over dx uh, times h bar over i of the wave function. And of course, any function of the operator x can be written easily in, inside the basis of x, as written on the second line in the box. Now, we know that the Hamiltonian is px squared over 2m plus vx, and if you use information from, from the box there, we can directly translate everything into the x representation, and we end up with this equation in the red box, which is the equation that you are used to, in, which is more a quantum physics approach, where everything is written in terms of differential operator. So we, we have the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation in position space. Okay? Now, if we want to... That is going to give us a time evolution as well. Uh, one thing that we would like to do is to simplify this, and we can suppose now that all the states that we want to work with are going to be expressed uh, using the energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. The reason why we want that is because if we have an energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, and provided the Hamiltonian is not explicitly dependent on time, we can calculate its evolution, since the time evolution operator is simply the complex exponential uh, e, e, e to the power minus i h t over h bar. Okay, so this is, in other words, if we apply this to an energy eigenstate, uh, this Exponential, complex exponential of an operator becomes simply a number because it applies directly to the energy E. And if we substitute this in, the, in this equation, which is the same equation on our previous slide, we end up with this new equation that says that the bracket Xe is actually just the solution of the, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian in the X representation. Um, and we obtain the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation which is h times a, fu a function, an eigenstate of energy, is equal to the energy times the eigenstate. So you see how we go from one to the other. There is, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, and this is the usual equation that we solve in one dimension, and you have probably solved that for a number of examples. So for example, we can solve this for the finite square well. For the finite square well, so just, just backing off a little bit on the previous slide, what matters in this red box is vx. So the potential there is going to define your problem. So that's what we, we need to, to find. And that's what is usually given as, as the problem. This defines the problem. So a typical example is the finite square well. And uh, the finite square well is obtained by the potential that's written there. It's, it's going to be zero everywhere unless the position, uh, unless x is larger than a over 2 or smaller than minus a over 2. In that case, it's going to be finite v0. And we are going to be interested in all those states that have an, a bound state. So in other words, the energy below, being below V0. Uh, that means that they don't have enough energy, enough kinetic energy, to escape the potential. That's the idea. Now, okay, we can rewrite the Schrodinger equation. We, and here I wrote it twice. We can write it inside the well and outside the well. And the only difference is, of course, in one case, VZ, there is no potential. The potential is 0. In the other case, the potential is V0. The thing is, because we, we, are, we suppose that we have bound state and given the, the type of Hamiltonian, the energy is going to be positive and it's always going to be smaller than V0. So in the first equation, I'm going to have a negative terms minus K square and a positive term Q square, where K and Q are obtained from uh, the two uh, equations at the bottom. So this would be a good time to pause the screencast and convince yourself that those two equations uh, work for uh, the full system that I look uh, that I showed you there. Uh, okay, so the two equations I have to solve are there. I have to solve are there, and these are fairly easy to solve. The first one uh, is going to give me an oscillatory solution uh, involving sine and cosine, and the other one is going to give me a exponential with a real uh, parameter. Um, like this, so we see and these that we still don't know. So this equation, the second equation that I just wrote there, C e q x plus d e minus q x, is valid outside the well, uh, but some, of course, on the right hand side. So when x increases, the first term has to vanish, so c has to be equal to zero. But on the left hand side, 
the first, second term has to vanish, otherwise the wave function would blow up and it would not be normalizable. So in the second case, so outside of the well but on the left hand side, d has to be equal to zero. Okay, so we have these equations and now we have to be able to connect them. We have to be able to connect those conditions and this is what's going to give us an idea of what A, B, C and D um, are. So the connecting solution, and this is the most important aspect of, of solving this, is that the wave function have to be continuous. Uh, this is the only way that the first derivative is well defined and clearly the first derivative has to be well defined. This is the linear momentum in, in, in uh, X representation. And the second term, which is not directly as obvious, is that the first derivative should be continuous. In other words, the second derivative um, should be well defined uh, as well. Okay, why is that so? Well, let's prove that, that the first derivative must also be continuous. If we calculate the second derivative using uh, the usual formula for, uh, for small displacement, the second derivative is nothing than the first derivative of the first derivative. And uh, that's obtained from uh, the integral of the second der first derivative of the first derivative. We can replace those derivatives by uh, the knowledge we have from Schrodinger equation. And then what we end up with, so on the right hand side of this, the equation on this slide, we find that that term, if we pick an epsilon that's small enough, will vanish. So the right hand side is going to vanish if epsilon is chosen small enough, unless the potential is infinite. If the potential is infinite, it's not going to vanish. So if the potential is finite, then the second derivative has to be equal to zero at the boundary, right? That's, that's the main idea. So now that we have all that information, we can introduce this continuity of the wave function's derivative. And by doing that, we are going to have information on the coefficients, but also on the value of k and q. And we'll find that k and q can only take some finite, some, some uh, quantized uh, integer solution, I mean, quantized solution. And that will explain why we have a quantized set of energy in the well. So we can, we can actually, um, sorry, we can actually calculate those, those energy. And this is what you, you've done um, many times before. So this is the way uh, those things are, are calculated. Now we can also look at a di different problem, which is the particle in the box problem, in which case the potential is uh, zero inside the box and infinite outside. So we really do not, there is no solution for which the, the, this bond, there is an, an, all the solution are bond state. There is no way to get a solution that can escape the, the potential. And same as before, we can write the equation inside and outside. And we find that the only way for, to be able to write the second equation is for the wave function to be zero because we have, uh, we have something that's finite, which is equal to infinite times zero. Uh, so this is the only way we can, can solve this, is to be the wave function to be zero. So inside the box, of course, we have the oscillatory solution. And uh, we have to impose that that solution vanishes at the, the, the two boundaries. And that gives me information on the two boundaries on the value of k. And this is what gives me the value of k. And uh, just to back off, just come back a little bit here. Uh, K is directly related to the energy. And therefore, we have also values of the energy that are allowed for this particular case. So this is how we can usually solve a uh, Schrodinger equation in one dimension. This is not uh, news to you, uh, but it is good to put it in the context of, of how we've solved uh, Schrodinger equation so far. OK, so now we are ready to look at the last section of this chapter. And uh, we are going to look at states that are not bound state. So the states that, are, that have an energy higher than the potential well, and so that they are actually scatter by the well. And this, this is going. This is this will allow us to introduce this notion of current, and uh, important consequence on uh, on really how quantum mechanics is organized. So the solution for the energy larger than the potential, uh, this kind of solution, you have a Gaussian wave packet that's uh, impinging from the left on the potential. Some of it will be transmitted and some of it will be reflected. And what we are interested in is say, what's the reflection coefficient? And what is the transmission coefficient? So for that, we are going to introduce what we call the probability current. And uh, clearly we know that psi star psi is the density probability. 
and a current pro probability current will be obtained by a, the time derivative of the probability density. So it's going to be given by the equation there. We can easily calculate this as being the derivative of a product of two function, and all we need to do is to know uh, how to calculate the derivative of the function itself. So we use Schrodinger equation for the first equation, and we use a complex conjugate for the second equation, remembering that v is a real number, and uh, the i is transforming to minus i for the complex conjugate. When we do that, we can now calculate this and obtain, by, just subst by substitution, we obtain this solution, which is just substituted, and just writing everything back together, we see that the potential terms disappear, and we end up with this solution that the derivative of, uh, of the charge density of the probability density is the probability current, which is nothing else than the minus the first derivative of the current density with respect to space. And the, current, the probability current is obtained from the equation that's right, written there. So something that's very important from this equation is that if the wave function was real, the probability current should be zero. So th there is no way to, ca to, to build a real wave function that can carry a current. That's what this equation tells us. I think, in my opinion, this is the most important result on, on this particular paragraph of the, of the section. But we can apply it to a given potential. And again, the potential is going to be defined a little bit just by a simple equation like this. And we are going to solve this for, sh for energy eigenstate that looks that, uh, for which the time evolution is simply a phase factor uh, depending on the energy. Now, the equation uh, for x more than zero uh, will be simply the Schrodinger equation without a potential. So it's kind of a free electron. And we obtain the free electron solution, which is a oscillating one. And we can calculate the current for this. And we'll find that the current, there is an incoming current that corresponds to the EIKX, it's a term in front of EIKX, and the reflected current, which is the term corresponding to minus IKX. We can then compute the, the reflection coefficient, which is the reflected versus incoming, and the transmission, which is transmitted over incoming. So we don't have the transmitted yet, so we, this is what we are going to calculate now. So this is how, what is the solution of the Schrodinger equation on the right-hand side of this, of this uh, well. Of course, we have two solutions on the, on the right-hand side. We have two cases, sorry. We have the case where the energy is larger than V0, and the case number two that we will treat on the next slide is when the energy is smaller than V0. So when the energy is larger than V0, the solution is also an oscillating solution, very much the same as before but with, with a K0, which is shifted, uh, as written on the screen. And if the particle is coming from the left, which is really a choice of the experiment, then the D is going to be equal to 0, because D uh, corresponds, the term D E minus I K0 X corresponds to particle coming from the right. So we suppose that none are coming from the right from very far away. So I end up with a solution Psi X is equal C E I K0 X, from which I can calculate transmitted uh, probability and, and, and uh, as being c squared over a squared times k0 over k. So we obtain the solution for the scattering. So the way we, we find the solution of a and c is by uh, connecting the solution of the, of the Schrodinger equation uh, at the interface. And again, we do the same as before. The wave function has to be um, continuous and the derivative has to be continuous. We, we did that exactly the same for the finite well. Uh, and we do not actually find constraint on the energy. When we do that, we, the only constraint we find is on A, B, and C. In fact, a scattering solution is, does, is a continuous uh, value of energy. The energy that you have is the energy of the ele that you decide to, to give to the free particle far away from the well. So you, can, you are allowed to take any energy, and then you're going to to see if the system is going to be, I mean, the, the wave function is going to be reflected or transmitted. And doing the calculation, I mean, here this is fairly trivial to do. We find the value of A, B, and C. And um, of course, we never get A because it's normalization factor, but we get a, B and C as function of A. And that allows me to calculate the reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient uh, using the well-known formula. Now, 
of course, we find that R plus T is equal 1. In other words, the reflection plus transmission is equal 1. We're not losing electron. The other solution uh, on the right-hand side is when the electrons, for example, the, the, the particles, have an energy lower than V0. In that case, the, the, wave, the, the Schrodinger equation is obtained by the equation here, and we know the solution. The only possible solution is a decaying solution with an expon a real exp uh, argument in the exponential exponent. And we find that the reflection in this case is 1. In fact, no solution of this problem can propagate very far away on the right-hand side. So we have a full reflection, even though C is not 0. So the reflection is actually not done right at the interface. It's done by the potential. So there is some skin effect inside the potential, but the, 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 there is really nothing that's transmitted in the system because that solution cannot live very far. In fact, it, in fact, it, it says an exponential uh, decay. So this is the way we would do scattering. So one thing to remember from all this, even though I went very fast on this because this is, these are most reminders, there are two things. We have bound state when the electrons are inside the well, and we have scattered state. And in that case, in the case of scattered state, we have a continuum of solution in terms of energy. In case of bound state, we have quantized states. So only some value of the energy are allowed. And they come directly from connecting the, the boundary conditions at um, the interfaces. So this concludes uh, our work on chapter 6.